Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. My name is Justin Kenny. I am the Green Infrastructure Coordinator for the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources, Department of Environmental Conservation. And uh, I want to welcome you to using iTree Hydro to model green infrastructure. Um, as some of you probably know, iTree Hydro is a standalone application. It's part of the iTree Suite from the Forest Service. Uh, designed to simulate the effects of changes in tree and impervious cover within a defined watershed on stream flow and water quality. Uh, it was initially designed to specifically handle urban vegetation effects so that urban natural resource managers and urban planners can quantify the impacts of changes in tree and impervious cover on uh, local hydrology to aid in the management and their planning decisions. Pretty excited today to be uh, joined in the webinar by Ted Andreni and the ECF team. Tom Taggart and Emily Steffen at SUNY. A um, little background on Ted. Ted uh, is a professor in the SUNY ESF Department of Environmental Resources Engineering in Syracuse, New York. He's got a PhD in Water Resources Engineering, MS in Agricultural and Biological Engineering, BS in Natural Resources Science, and licensure as a professional engineer and professional hydrologist, so he knows his stuff. He has been a developer of uh, iTree Hydro and other iTree tools through his research partnership with USDA Forest Service. Uh, he teaches and mentors students in engineering methods to monitor, model, and restore natural resources for the sustainable provision of needed services while also addressing population, land use, and climate change pressures. Uh, Ted DSF team uses environmental resources engineering to help communities plan, design, and manage for food, water, energy, and health security. Um, and as I said, Ted's going to be joined by PhD students Tom Taggart and Emily Steffen. Now before I hand it over to them, just want to make a few quick notes. So uh, we're using the question feature today, so everyone's going to be muted throughout the webinar. So if you have a burning question that you want to ask, please use the question pane, which should be on the right-hand side of your screen under the GoToWebinar controls. There's also a chat feature if you just wanted to have chat during webinars, that's fine. Um, but questions is really what we're going to be focusing on. There will be a few breaks throughout the webinar where uh, I'll pose questions to Ted and the team, and then they'll respond, and then we'll move on with the webinar. We do have uh, an insanely high number of people who did not expect this. We had about 360 people register, and there's just now 188 on. So there's a pretty good chance that we will not get to all the questions. Um, and what we'll do then is I will make a copy of the chat log and uh, send that to Ted, Tom, and Emily, and then they will respond to some questions, and I can send it out to email to all the attendees. The other thing that I'll say is that we, we are going to record the webinar, so we're currently doing that. Um, we have a YouTube channel where I've posted the previous webinars, and so this one will go on there probably early next week. Um, I just have to do some encoding on it. So once that goes up, I'll send an email out again to all the attendees, and then um, if you want to pass that on or watch again, Feel free. So uh, without any further ado, I am going to hand it over to Ted, Tom, and Emily. Hello, everyone. I wish we could take time to go around the room and learn about you because both the folks over in the Vermont Green Infrastructure Office and us here at ESF know that there's a lot of wisdom there, and we're going to at the very end of this presentation, make an open solicitation that you can communicate with us because we do want to know your insights because they'll inform our modeling. So at this point, Justin, I think you can still speak with me and share the phone. I just want to confirm that my screen is live. Uh, yeah, looks good to me. Okay. So here we go. We're going to walk you through approximately 50 slides. We want to manage your expectations. We'll have moments where we pause in between units to allow for individuals to possibly post some questions. Justin will help gather those, as he mentioned, and then we'll field them primarily at the end of the presentation. So I want to point out right away that we're backed by a very strong team, and I mentioned three of them at the very base of this slide. We have the USDA Forest Service that is the sponsor of the iTree Toolkit. You can find these tools online at itreetools.org. You have Davy Tree Company that is the backbone of the software development. And we've been working very closely with two of those individuals at Davy, 
Mike Binkley and Michael Kerr to get the most recent GUI available. And then we have our ESF team. And I do want to take time to point out the very top of the slide. We have Tom Taggart, who's been doing a lot of leadership, and Emily Steffen, who is stepping up to share that leadership. And there are many more that have been before them, including Yang Yang and Jun Wang, that were principal to getting the iTree Hydro model up and going. So with that, let's move forward. So the overview of this webinar is an introduction to the iTree Hydro software and a discussion about green infrastructure. We understand that the audience has people that have interests split between those two areas and then sharing those two. So we have some individuals want to learn more about hydro, perhaps regardless of green infrastructure simulation, and others that want to know about hydro specifically for that. Then we will follow that with three illustrations of green infrastructure being used in iTree Hydro. We have a watershed simulation, we have an urban simulation, and we have a single tree simulation. And then we will close with an insight to the future development for iTree Hydro and an open appeal for you to participate because part of our research strategy is to bring the users in during the model development. So let's jump into the overview of iTree Hydro. This is an illustration that walks you through three different levels of development. You see on the left a pre-developed site where we have the tree scape and soil below it, and you have blue arrows that are showing you a vertical balance of fluxes. The larger arrow at the top, and I do have some tools that Justin and Danielle have shown me, but one is just my browser here, is our precipitation in. And that precipitation is partitioned into infiltration, which is a predominant component, upwards of 40 or more percent, some into surface runoff, and a large percentage into evapotranspiration. As you develop, the urban hydrology is to change those allocations. With the same amount of precipitation, we will see a smaller amount of infiltration due to impervious cover a larger amount of surface runoff, and the quality of these fluxes usually is degraded due to a host of urban pollutants, including total suspended solids, nutrients, and metals. The blended approach is to go in and perform what we might refer to as a green infrastructure intervention. And here, I just have to move a few things around my screen, we see that we have the same precip and we've increased our infiltration, improved the quality of that infiltration by the arrow turning blue from brown, and we've reduced the amount of surface runoff. So what does iTree Hydro do to simulate that urban hydrology and the green infrastructure intervention, also known as perhaps a low impact development approach? Well, this is a slide where we walk you through 12 items. The first is the model needs inputs. And those inputs include weather data such as solar radiation, rain, winds, air temperature, humidity, and then many map layers. And those map layers must include a land cover because we're interested in that surface condition and an elevation data set because we're interested in how the water redistributes throughout the watershed. If you look then at number two, you'll see that our tree comes in right here as canopy interception. That's a detailed simulation that we have within the model. And number three tells us that we have depression storage that can be within a rooftop or in a street in a pothole. Number four brings us over to surface runoff. Number five is our infiltration. Number six is an update on our soil moisture, including a water table budget. Number seven is going to be evaporation from the surface. Number eight, evaporation from the canopy. That's different than transpiration. That's water that's being held in the leaves or on the bark. Number nine, 
is our evapotranspiration. This arrow could be in many places. I'm illustrating it here in the grass. Number 10 is our subsurface runoff. And number 11 brings us over to the idea that we have lateral connectivity. So in my watershed, I can have a variety of land cover types. And each one represented within my watershed can be explicitly or statistically connected with others. And these arrows moving left to right show you that I can have a high water table in one area of my watershed and a lower water table in another. And I will maintain a lateral flux. The last number is what we're going to focus on during the close of this talk, which is our outputs. So one of the exciting things that's happening right now is we're in the midst of preparing the release of a new graphical user interface. And here's a screenshot. It looks similar to what has been available to the using user community. And it's an intermediate release that's planned for late summer, perhaps August. And we're hopeful to get it into your hands, particularly a beta group, to get feedback. We currently are having active exchange, as I mentioned, with Davey, tree company. And we've been making some adjustments to it as we prepare for the seminar. One of the features that we like most about iTree is that it's a parsimonious model, meaning that it doesn't depend on data that are difficult to get. You do not need a highly instrumented watershed. Ideally, you can grab federally or state data, federally available or state available data. And so this shot shows you that the user interface allows you to browse for stream gauge data, weather data. And we're now preparing release of what we refer to as topographic index data. So the user can, through the interface, gather all of, all of the data sets that they should need. What we're going to do at this point is we're going to walk you through what are the common data inputs. So if we think back on that schematic where I had 12, error, 12 numbers moving along, the first one was inputs. And we're going to show you how we go about starting a project. And then we'll refer to these steps as we show you the simulations for the watershed area, the urban area. So right here, Tom and Emily have prepared this to show that we're going to move into Vermont. And we're going to be in Chittenden County and look at South Burlington. And so that project location at the top left of the screen is an area that we want to show you how you might proceed. So right here, what you might do if you want to work with a watershed simulation and have observed stream flow to calibrate your model and see how well your model is predicting observed conditions is get into the USGS stream flow data to identify the nearest gauge to your project location. You then have basic watershed characteristics. These include watershed area, but primarily it's important to get your tree cover. And so an iTree tool is dependent on this type of data set. Here, we get land cover data through the iTree canopy tool. So Emily went out and did a heads up digitizing to characterize the land cover data for Burlington and for Allenbrook watershed. You drop a point, and in this tool, which was spoken about over the same webinar series a few weeks ago, you can then classify the land cover type. The next two data sets that we would get if we want to perform a calibration would be stream flow data from a gauging station, or advanced user can load their own, and then weather station data if you want to do a historic simulation. You can also use future weather, and we do that here at ESF to look at climate change scenarios. So stream data, again, it's an option, but you would typically go to a USGS gauge. And you can see two examples of those gauges here. Those data are often updated automatically. And again, if you browse USGS real-time data, you will see that these are available as a time series. And that time series, you would then load into iTree Hydro. iTree Hydro allows for this 
to be done through the graphical user interface. It's a great feature. Weather data, similarly, are available through the interface. Here's a weather station at ESF. And the data for the weather and the flow have been updated. They're available for 2005 through 2012. The version that is currently available only has 2005 data. The version that is about to be released has through this current water year. So the last step in a traditional approach, and for the approach that's out there now, has been to get a DEM file and to get your watershed. We've simplified this approach to make the model more accessible. And we've worked with David Wallach of the USGS, who has created a national topographic index data set. That's a derivative of the elevation data. So the DEM is processed by the USGS and created a topographic index file. We use those files now for any urban area or any watershed. And they are pre-clipped thanks to the hard work of one of the individuals at Davy Tree Company. Alexis, and she has made these available to our other coding team, and they should be coming through the interface for you in August. So here is an example of a DEM clip for a watershed of Syracuse's outlet, it's the Onondaga Creek watershed. And to the right is a topographic index from that DEM. That just tells you the topographic index values and the likelihood of encountering them throughout the watershed. The higher values are wetter, and they help us do the lateral redistribution of the water balance. And it's based on a very common modeling framework called top model. So moving over to the green infrastructure component and leaving behind for just a moment the model framework, there are many different green infrastructure types that you might be interested in examining within this iTree Hydro model. We have nine here that we believe can be represented in the current model formulation by creatively adjusting land cover types and land cover parameters and hydrologic parameters. And we'll work today on showing you how we would simulate permeable pavement, a rain garden, a green roof, a rain barrel, and urban tree cover. And as I mentioned, there's a future development of this model. And we're going to have a release again in, we hope, 2013 that will bring you a step closer to actually having green infrastructure widgets that you could drop into this model. So if you think about those green infrastructure components, there were nine of them. We mentioned permeable pavement. We mentioned rain gardens and green roofs and rain barrels and just a single tree. We're now going to look inside the graphical user interface a little bit more and look at the land cover parameters and the hydrological parameters and talk about how they might be changed in order to represent those different green infrastructure scenarios. And then in the second part of this talk, we'll go through the actual simulation case studies and show you what changes we have made. So you can see that we have surface cover types. And those cover types need to add to 100%. Underneath any one of those cover types, you can have another cover type, perhaps. So underneath tree cover, if you look to the bottom left of this graphical user interface, you can see that I could have shrub cover, herbaceous cover, soil cover, or impervious cover. And so as you plant a tree in an urban area, you might have the canopy extend over impervious cover. And many, work, many case studies performed by Dr. Dave Nowak at the USDA Forest Service examine this scenario and help communities understand what their current condition, we refer to as a base case, is. And then how planting an additional percentage of trees, perhaps going up to 100% tree cover in their area of interest, changes their hydrology and their water quality. And what will happen is you can allow impervious cover to range from 0 to 100% when tree cover is at 100% with this fictitious idea, but illustrative of a grow out that you can have urban trees that have canopy over impervious cover. I say fictitious because it's unlikely a community will have 100% impervious cover under 100% canopy. But you can imagine for a single tree, you in an urban area along a sidewalk can find its canopy extending so that you have below the tree perhaps as little as 5% 
is soil impervious and the rest, the 95%, is impervious sidewalk and street. So here are the surface cover types. Here are parameters that you would set, such as leaf area index. Another is directly connected impervious cover. This value is important, and this value is something that we provide guidance with through iTree. There are functions that relate an urban area's impervious cover to the directly connected impervious cover, and users can also make their own independent estimate. And then we have tree cover types that I mentioned that can be below the canopy. Okay, so then we have our hydrologic parameters. There's an option to have a current parameter set that becomes auto-calibrated. So the model has spent a lot of time in this mode to help the user get calibrated parameters so they can have a sense of assurance that they're representing existing conditions adequately. And we'll get into this a little bit more as we move along the talk. We also have an annual average flow that we would like the user to provide. And this is a value that we guide them through by either them loading, the user loading through the GUI, graphical user interface, observe data, or by taking it from the precipitation data. It helps the model make an initial guess at the base flow or groundwater flow conditions. Then we have soil type that the user will select. Right now there's one representative soil type for the watershed. As we move along, we're going to give the user a choice to select as many soil types as they want and then take an effective average. Once you select your soil type, there will be certain hydrologic parameters that come from that that help with the infiltration routines. Then we have a depth of root zone and an initial soil saturation condition because you might want to have an initial condition where soils are coming out of a winter condition and saturated. You might have a dry. It's a percent of the total. Those parameters then can be saved as a new file. They can be edited. They can be deleted. Right here, we have an option for more advanced user to select that they would like to work with some of the advanced setting parameters. You can see that there's a list here that might go beyond the knowledge of some people in your research group, and it might satisfy for those that are hydrology interested, an opportunity to look at some of the nuances within their watershed. So, for example, the leaf transition period, when the leaves are on, when they're off, what your tree index, tree bark area index would be, what your leaf storage depth would be. And if you can consider these, these will help you calibrate your model and help your model fit the observed conditions. So right here are the two options where you can choose, if you wish, to auto-calibrate parameters, and then you can look at the calibration results. And you can see now, as I've been going through this, that the right-hand side of the screen has a help section that informs you on what is available through that parameter. So another part of the graphical user interface is to allow the model user to look at alternative scenarios, including green infrastructure. So you've set up your base case of current conditions. And as we showed, Emily went out and she used iTree canopy and got surface cover type percentages. But now she has a plan to change those to look at another management scenario. And this is the screen in which you would update those scenarios. So the alternative case for surface cover types and for cover types beneath. So perhaps your shrub cover increases a certain amount, and perhaps your impervious cover decreases a certain amount. And then your directly connected impervious, this might be a scenario where you have a build out and you actually see more of your watershed connected. So at this point, we've gone through a good portion of the talk that deals with the model itself by introducing you to the new GUI and talking about some of the inputs, the processes, and we've alluded to some of the outputs. The outputs that we'll show you in this next section will speak to stormwater runoff volume and stormwater runoff quality. At this stage, Justin, I think I should pause and allow you to come in and let us know if you want to take questions from the audience and start to compile those now. 
Yeah, let's do that. We've got a couple questions, and uh, Danielle Fitzko with the Department of Forest Parks and Rec here in Vermont is uh, actually right by my side, so she's got them. She's going to ask you a couple. Hi. So the first one that's come in uh, asks, can hydro model the variation in evapotranspiration and canopy interception for various tree species? Right now, the way that iTree Hydro works is we have an evapotranspiration value that is a potential value for the atmosphere. And based on what the user has given as a leaf area index and the height of tree, different resistances are imposed to reduce or constrain that potential evapotranspiration. So they can put in leaf area index values or tree heights that would allow for species type variation. There are other ways to go about this that are useful. And as we build our species list and tightly couple iTree Hydro with the other iTree tools such as ECO, we're considering going over to stomatal conductance values that do vary by species. Okay, the next, uh, I'm going to put two together. These are about the um, imagery. How important is it to have high resolution tree canopy layer as an input? And also, is there an advantage to using LIDAR sourced DEMs? The importance is a function of what the user wants to derive from the model output. The iTree toolkit as we've mentioned, is designed to be as user-friendly as possible. That we can rely on some governing relationships and not worry about second or third order effects. If the user can, without using LIDAR, and using their own reconnaissance, a statistical sample perhaps, or other land cover imagery such as the National Land Cover Database, perhaps updated with a correction that Dave Nowak's group has provided for a more accurate, impervious, and canopy cover value. They can load those values. The LIDAR imagery, when processed, can provide even more details. And we do value those under some of our research grade simulations. More urban areas are getting these. So I'm going to remain in the equivocating mode that it really depends on what the user needs to get from the model. This model ranges from research grade, where you give it the highest detailed inputs and it's going to conserve the mass fluxes for you, to a scoping model that allows users to consider what-if scenarios. OK, I'm going to ask uh, one more before we uh, allow you to move on again. Uh, are there plans for uh, the hydro team to work with urban stormwater regulators? and modelers to make hydro usable for specific needs on the stormwater side? Absolutely. So what we are in the midst of at this point is a new generation of modeling tools coming out. There's a component of this that's referred to as iTree Landscape. That's coupling the elements of iTree Eco, which looks at tree species that urban communities are interested in planting to regulate perhaps air quality and energy consumption as well as hydrology. And as communities consider those tree types, we want to make sure that the user inputs are convenient for individuals that are complying with regulation. We also want to make sure that the model outputs are tran easily translated into compliance reporting. So when we close this talk, we're going to have, as I've mentioned, an appeal to the users to stay closely involved in what we refer to as a transparent and comprehensive ecological modeling framework so that we can ensure that the inputs, the processes, and the outputs are actually usable by the urban forest community and city and regional planners, as well as residential homeowners or not-for-profit or non-governmental organizations within urban areas with an interest in tree canopy and its effects on the urban environment. All right, 
Great. So there's a few more, but we'll hold off on those till a little bit later on. So uh, if you want to continue on, that'd be great. Okay, we're going to go. So we have three green infrastructure simulations we're excited to share with you. And the first one is a watershed simulation. This is the way that iTree Hydro has worked since its release, but it's not the way that we've always had to run it within our own research lab. And so we have additional ways that we are excited to share with you that they follow, the urban simulation and the single tree simulation. So a watershed simulation, let's step into that. Right here, thanks to Tom's hard work, we have the Allen Brook Vermont watershed that's been prepared for this presentation. You can see that the outlet is near Williston, Vermont, and that the watershed is approximately 10 square miles. In 2005, this watershed was identified as stormwater impaired, and you can see that there have been an ongoing effort for tree plantings. The watershed simulation requires that a digital elevation model, or DEM, is obtained in order to delineate that watershed and generate what we refer to as the topographic index. So Tom wants to make sure that you understand these steps because they're readily doable, but without guidance for the inexperienced, they may seem mysterious. The first step is you avail yourself to the US Geological Survey mapping tools that are online. It's part of the National Water Information System. And you zoom into the site of interest. And here we have done that, and you can find Allen Brook at Vermont 2A, near Essex Junction, Vermont. As you go into the USGS gauge, you can locate the county and town. And so here, we selected the gauge, and then we select the location map. We found Chittenden County, and we see again that it's near Essex Junction. If you go back and look at this slideshow later, you'll see that at the user input on the new graphical user interface, you're going to be asked for your state, county, town, and then the model will go and load for you the USGS gauging data. So at this point, you've just used this mapping tool to help you identify the county and the town for your site of interest. The next step is that you're going to actually delineate the watershed. I love this personally. And I think there should be coffee table books of watersheds for every community to just gaze at because they're beautiful fractal images and even when they're in the black and white to gray scale. So the tool that we've used is ArcGIS, but there are freeware tools that are available including Saga GIS and many others. And so here we have a screenshot that Emily put together showing how ArcGIS can be used, and you drop a pore point, which is a term used by ArcGIS, based on what the USGS gauging station told you about the latitude and longitude. And this is exciting, exciting stuff. The fact that you can go and consider latitude and longitude will reconnect you with your elementary school self. It's a point that often does not fall directly on the stream network of the DEM due to inaccuracies in reporting and level of precision in reporting. But there are built-in features that allow it to be snapped onto that little map, which is referred to as a flow accumulation map. And then you clip, and you see over to the left, we have the Allen Brook watershed with the same poor point identified near the outlet. The next is to get land cover with iTree Canopy. And so the land cover data we use the iTree Canopy tool that Al Zalea spoke about a few weeks ago on the same webinar. And here, those values are going to be brought in to the user interface that we showed you earlier. An optional step in a watershed run is to do a calibration. It's optional. You do not need to have observed discharge. And even if you do have observed discharge, you do not need to calibrate. But the calibration is something in the scientific community that we value greatly. But for a scenario where you're doing a comparison of two different futures for your watershed, a calibration is going to have less value. And I'd be happy to take questions about that later today or in the future. But this is a step that is facilitated by the parameter estimation 
tool called PEST, and this is provided by Dr. John Doherty, who has consulted with us in the iTree group and built into our model a calibration toolkit that's working behind the scenes for the user. Right now, the user community is locked into a hour-by-hour hour time series calibration, which is a very intimate calibration. And it's intimate because at each hour of the storm, your runoff that you predict may be out of sync with the observed due to simple explanations that your weather station is actually located 10 miles away from your actual watershed. And the EPA and its other models, such as HSPF, which is a hydrologic simulation program Fortran, has worked with PEST, as has the USGS with their groundwater tool called ModFlow. So PEST is a proven tool. We're proud to have it in iTree Hydro. It's got a variety of calibration opportunities. And it can also now, in our model, in one of the near releases, calibrate for daily or monthly or any other time step to increase the robustness of that calibration for the user community that's looking at a scoping level. So as we said, this is a case study illustration at the watershed level, and we want to show you three different green infrastructure scenarios. So I actually, at this point, I'm going to start off with a permeable pavement one, which is the first column. What we have in that column is an illustration of something that's similar to FlexiPave, highly porous surface material that allows the rainfall to directly connect with the soil beneath it. And the way that we're going to simulate this in the iTree Hydro model is to reduce the amount of impervious cover and swap that into our soil cover. So at this point, we don't have our drop-down widget of permeable pavement. That will be something that comes in the next release, but it can be mod it can be simulated by a simple parameter and land cover input modification. So that's the first column is permeable pavement. The next scenario that we're going to illustrate is in addition to permeable pavement. So a city such as Burlington or the watershed in Wilson for Allen Brook has decided they want to install permeable pavement. That's their first step. They want to split up their directly connected impervious area. There's no green, perhaps, in that permeable pavement. Now, after their permeable pavement has gone in, they've decided we're going to put in rain gardens, which might take a little bit more time to put in. And you will increase, perhaps, the shrub cover, perhaps the tree cover. You'll increase, perhaps, the hydraulic conductivity. And you'll decrease, perhaps, the amount of impervious cover. Perhaps not. You might be putting this into existing green lawn areas. And then in this column, the second column over, in addition to the rain garden, we're going to bring in a green roof, which means that we'll reduce our impervious cover even more. All the rooftop imperviousness that we want to go into green roof will now be swapped into an herbaceous cover. So those are the land cover types that we're going to modify to represent our second scenario. Our third scenario that we're going to present to you is the permeable pavement has been put in, same as the prior two. Our rain garden and green roof have been put in as the prior. And now we've also, for other homes, added rain barrels. So you might know that green roofs may still release runoff, or there will be structures that cannot hold a green roof. And you'll have a certain volume that you can hold in the rain barrel. And the way that we modify the model to represent the rain barrel is by changing a hydrologic parameter of impervious or pervious detention storage. This scenario right here is a single tree. And I put that out there as foreshadowing. We're going to come to that near the end of the talk. That's an important intervention, particularly if you live in the areas of New York and Vermont where you can enjoy those fall colors. OK, so here we have some of the results of our green infrastructure and the watershed simulation. We refer to the base case as the existing conditions that Emily and Tom put together for Allen Brook. And you can see that our total flow for the year of 2012 is 
4.7 million cubic meters. Those are volumes that sometimes are hard to get your mind around. And those can be represented as an average flow rate in the model as well. The three colors that we're using represent the components of the runoff that added up to that total flow. The bottom blue is referred to as our base flow. That's the water that's coming through the soil and contributing to the stream. The red is the pervious flow. That's flow that's coming from the non-impervious areas of the watershed. It's not being generated as base flow. It's through flow. And then the green is the impervious flow. It's the smallest percentage because Allen Brook has a relatively small percentage of impervious cover, near 7% of the total watershed area. And that's one of the conditions that I want to take a moment to point out, is when you do watershed modeling, your urban area may be a small percentage of that total watershed. And that's just fine. That's the way that the geography has presented itself. However, if you want to focus on that urban area, it's been difficult to do that in the existing version of iTree. The release that we have coming this summer, as we'll show you in this talk, allows you to move away from a watershed analysis and do any area of interest, an urban area or perhaps just a single plot. So returning to the slide, you can see that the impervious flow, the impervious cover flow is a small fraction of the total flow for the base case. Now here's something to point out. Our first scenario for green infrastructure is permeable pavement. So we came along and we changed a few of the model parameters that I've mentioned before. We had our impervious cover decrease from 7.3% to 5% to represent 2.3% going into impervious cover. I can see Vermont in, in endeavoring into this type of intervention. Because we don't have an impervious cover drop down for a green infrastructure widget, we instead now use soil cover, which we increased by 2.3%, the amount of our reduction in impervious cover. As a result, our directly connected impervious cover changed from 3% to 1% for the watershed. What that did is that allowed more water that would be moving through the watershed to actually make it to runoff particularly through the base flow component. So what we have done is we've naturalized our hydrology by allowing our water tables to recharge. We're probably getting cooler flow and cleaner flow and less flashy flow. And we've decreased the amount of evaporation from depression storage that would have been happening within our urban watershed. So the total flow volume for the year has gone up most of it due to healthy base flow into our streams, not the flashy hydrographs that are known to scour and damage urban infrastructure. You can see that the impervious cover flow is reduced. So this is a scenario of one green infrastructure intervention, just permeable pavement. Now Emily just put together this slide and very helpfully reminds us that our next green infrastructure intervention has the permeable pavement and the rain gardens and green roofs. So what we did here is we kept our soil cover at 2.6%. Our impervious cover was further reduced to 3% as many of the roofs were converted to green roofs. Our directly connected impervious cover stayed at 1%. Beneath the trees, we had an increase in impervious cover. And what happened is we've actually, in these rain gardens, planted more trees. And we have, beneath those trees, impervious cover from roads and sidewalks. It went up to 50% tree cover from 48% tree cover. In addition, we could represent more herbaceous cover on that green roof. What we've done is we've 
slowed it down, and allowed for much more evapotranspiration. So our total runoff has decreased by 100,000 cubic meters in a smaller fraction yet of impervious cover flow. You might say, well, wait, the base flow has gone down. Should we be concerned about that? That is something that each watershed has to look at about what are healthy base flows. My sense is that for Allen Brook, these changes from what I've seen in our weekly scenarios are allocated to the month of October and November. This in 2012 was a dry summer, if you remember, and then we had a wet fall follow. And so these variations in base flow aren't representative of a climatic pattern, but are representative of a single year of interesting weather. The final scenario that you see still has a tremendous amount of flow. We're at 3.9 million cubic meters of flow, and we've just shifted the seasonality of this that you don't see within an annual lump value. What you do see, though, is that our base flow has decreased a little bit more. It's not going to zero here. Don't fret. We're not drying up the stream. What we've gotten rid of, though, is the impervious runoff has gone away. This third scenario has introduced rain barrels. And so we're storing the water that's coming off of impervious surface roofs and then reallocating it later perhaps even into evapotranspiration. So now that you see the way that this slide is laid out, where we have a base case, and then we have our three green infrastructure simulations, I'm going to take you to the next slide, where we don't look at total flow. We look only at one flow component. This is the impervious cover flow. <clears throat> this might be of most interest to some of the urban planners that are working with the regulators and goes back to one of the audience questions of is the model going to be useful for those that are working with the regulatory community and we hope so. So if in Syracuse you have something that is a reduction target of impervious cover flow, this tool should help you scope out how those reductions can come along. So we have our base case and you can see here we have a little over 14,000, approximately 15,000 cubic meters for the year of 2012. When we introduced the permeable pavement, you saw this reduction before, but it was a small part of that total bar graph. So here we're highlighting it. It's reduced by more than half. When we, in addition to the permeable pavement, add the rain gardens and green roofs, we have reduced it further, and then the rain barrels take the remaining component. The rain barrels are representing a impervious surface that has been completely disconnected at this point. The directly connected impervious area has gone to zero. This would be the holy grail, so to speak, for a green infrastructure intervention. And the point of this scenario is to illustrate our aspirations. You can use the tool to illustrate any of your management goals. The final component that we wanted to point to is the water quality component. The model uses an EPA event mean concentration approach to look at a host of urban pollutants, including total suspended solids. And as you might know, the suspended solids often have sorbed to them metals and nutrients, but they can be estimated independently as well within I tree hydro. So here, we can present to you a weakness in our current green infrastructure simulation. If you look at the base case, you can see that we have approximately 200,000 grams of total suspended solids for the year. When we move to permeable pavement, it's gone up. The reason for this is we have represented permeable pavement with a soil cover type, which is linked to an increase in total suspended solids. So here you're looking within the planning room of the iTree team, and what we've been working toward is a more exact representation of permeable pavement that doesn't lead to an increase in this total suspended solids. 
We do want to point this out to you right now, though, so you can explain it to yourselves if you see this type of result. The next scenario is, again, the permeable pavement is in place. Our directly connected impervious area has been reduced, but we've increased the tree canopy and we've changed some of the land cover types and the land cover types below the canopy to represent rain gardens and green roofs. Here, our total suspended solids went down because we have less impervious cover. And in our upcoming releases, this will allow for you to spatially simulate the interception of runoff by your pervious green infrastructure. So the rain garden could be placed to take street runoff that has turbidity and allow for it to infiltrate and settle out. We continue with the reduction of total suspended solids here by the introduction of the rain barrels as a component to the third green infrastructure scenario. The way that the event mean concentration model works, and we refer to this as EMC, is it takes the total flow that we showed on the earlier slides and multiplies it with the average concentration in the runoff. The average concentrations are not changing, but the amount of land area generating the runoff and generating the pollutants is changing. So right now, we've just closed a watershed simulation example that's very common to most users. It's the way that the iTree model currently works. And We've used it in that framework to look at green infrastructure designs. Right at this point, we're entering the urban simulation, something that we're really excited about. And if Syracuse weren't such a fine city offering so many civic amenities and natural resources, we would wish we were here with you in Burlington, Vermont, because we know it to be equally fair and fun. So we've chosen Burlington. And you can see on the left, there's a polygon file showing you the urban DEM. There's more than one watershed that goes through this urban area, yet we don't need to limit ourselves to the watershed area. We can now use, thanks to Dave Wallach's help at the US Geological Survey, the topographic index values that were created for the nation and run the simulations of an effective wetness distribution and come up with a water balance and an estimate on pollutant loads for that urban area. If you also take a moment to just gaze at that urban area, it's surrounding, at this point, the Chesapeake Lake. Excuse me. Let me, go, let me take you back a little bit further north. Lake Champlain. We're not in Delaware or Maryland. So we're That's at recovery. Lake Champlain. <laughs> I know that there are fine downtown areas in both. So yeah, so we have Lake Champlain here. And we've clipped that out. One thing to notice is that many waterfront communities do consider their waterfront part of their municipality. And so if you move into this framework of modeling, you do need to be aware that it could be important for you to clip out the actual water areas that are beyond your land surface and not important to you in your analysis of land cover effects. The other thing to notice is that we have 10.6 square miles, which is bigger than the Allen Brook simulation. And if you look at this downtown shot, you know you have a GI-inspired community. So Emily went and used the iTree Canopy Toolkit and performed the sampling analysis and came up with the land cover types to populate the iTree Hydro model. We then ran the model using the steps that we introduced at the beginning of this presentation. And we came up with the results for our three green infrastructure scenarios. We have the same three. And what we've done here is we've applied the same percent adjustments from Allen Brook to Burlington. So we, in the Allen Brook example, reduced impervious cover to 33% of the original impervious. We reduced directly connected impervious area to 33% of its original. In the Burlington example, we had the same percent reduction. And we started with an initial value of directly connected impervious of 23%. Now here's where, 
a user that wants to heighten the accuracy of their model parameters and land cover values could do a more detailed analysis of what is the directly connected impervious area. The values that we're using are coming from EPA guidance on relationships between directly connected impervious area and impervious area. And if you want more insight on that, you can contact us and we can send that along. So here we have a reduction in our directly connected impervious area, affectionately known as DCIA. And you can see that immediately our impervious flow for 2012 dropped from more than 600,000 to approximately 200,000 cubic meters. What we've done is we've taken the surface runoff and we've forced it to reconnect with pervious area. And if you can imagine, the base flow went up dramatically. Now, in the second scenario, we've added rain gardens and green roofs. We kept our directly connected impervious area the same. And we've increased evapotranspiration. And we've kept impervious flow approximately the same with the first green infrastructure intervention. The third green infrastructure intervention adds the rain barrels. It adds a further reduction in directly connected impervious area. And you can see that our impervious flow has become even lower as our base flow went down as well. And we were able to bring you these results thanks to the actual model user interface where we entered each one of these scenarios into the model run, performed the run, and then went to the output viewer of the interface to grab our values and plot them here in Excel. If you look at total suspended solids, they follow a similar pattern with the impervious cover flow. The total grams are relatively small at this point. I think we're under reporting, actually. And I apologize for that. You have more than 60 grams of total suspended solids in Burlington. You're not that clean. But we do appreciate the efforts. And you have your base case. And then you see more than a 50% reduction with the permeable pavement introduced a comparable decrease with the rain gardens and green roofs, and then a further reduction when you add the rain barrels and increase your disconnected impervious area. So we have a final case study, one that's really exciting for us. It's a new frontier for the model. It actually pairs nicely with some work that's going on in New Hampshire as well, where the New Hampshire Stormwater Center is looking at single tree interventions we here in Syracuse are proud to host a Save the Rain program. And for those that haven't looked into this, I encourage you to enter that phrase. You'll see that Onondaga County has brought on CH2M Hill, who's overseeing the project. And one of the highlights is that our on-center green roof has been installed. Right north of this green roof, we have our war memorial which has another type of green infrastructure highlight where it's taking stormwater and using it to form the ice within the arena. And if you are true Vermonters, you probably have some interest in hockey. And you might have noted that that Syracuse ice hockey team, the Syracuse Crunch, was one win away from taking the Calder Cup this year. So this green infrastructure is throughout the city. This is just one of more than 50 different programs. Here, to respond to a user question earlier, I show you in the bottom left a LIDAR. That's light imaging detection and ranging. Light detection and ranging image that shows you the canopy cover of the Syracuse area. And that little red roof down here is actually the carrier dome where we have our Syracuse men's basketball team and lacrosse teams play. This type of land cover can be used with our single tree simulations. And we can get the geometry and the leaf area index for our trees. So in this single tree simulation, we've been asked by the Save the Rain group to help them understand how a single tree of different age would affect the water budget. And they had us place the tree within a rain garden for the simulation, not above impervious cover. And we took a single year where we had 
close to half a meter of rainfall and approximately 77 millimeters of liquid equivalent snow. Believe me, we get a lot more snow than 77 millimeters, but once you melt it, it comes to 77 millimeters. And then we force that precipitation on an hourly time step over a single tree. And this is just brilliant work done by Tom that allowed him to consider how can he go into the model and tweak the topographic index requirements and run a single cell. And now that he's discovered that, we're planning on providing this as a new feature in one of the upcoming releases. With that simulation, Tom was able to help the team at Save the Rain see that a single tree was predicted for that year of rainfall to intercept 70 millimeters, a significant fraction of the total rainfall, falling as drizzle and accumulating in the leaf surfaces across that canopy. And then the tree intercepted an even larger fraction of the snow. The snow was held into the tree canopy. As you notice, often the wet snow doesn't even fall into the ground below unless there's wind throw and blow afterwards. And the total runoff for this scenario was 145 millimeters, which is a smaller fraction of the runoff than would be in an urban area, redirecting that water balance into interception, interception infiltration, and evapotranspiration. So here's a single tree, and I put the word sing to let you know that we're rhapsodizing about our tree effects. So Justin, we have one last component, but I thought I would pause here before we go into that component. Where, as you can see at slide 49, we only have 53 or so, and so there's very little left, but it's an important point we want to make to the audience, and I'd like to pause here, take questions, and then pick up on our last element about the ongoing model development. Sounds good. Uh, we've got about 30 minutes left, so there should be plenty of time, and uh, I believe Danny has some more questions. Yep. Um, Ted, there were quite a few questions that came in regarding rain barrels. Um, and so I'm going to kind of lump them together. Uh, one of them is that people are saying it seems like it's pretty optimistic, the results we're getting with rain barrels. Uh, can you share what percentage of the roof um, runoff that you're including in your model? Um, there's also talk about um, are you emptying the rain barrels in between uh, events? And what assumptions on how rain barrels reduce total suspended solids uh, since it collects water from roof runoff. So I guess a general discussion around your assumptions um, around rain barrels. Absolutely. So the first thing I want to tell everyone is that there needs to be a healthy skepticism about the influence of rain barrels because their influence is tied to how they are managed. And many users myself included, will passively empty a rain barrel where they have a hose coming off that is allowing for the entering flow to be redirected into areas of the garden that are disconnected from the impervious cover. If you don't do that, most rain barrels unfortunately aren't emptied in a timely manner and the next storm comes along and often surcharges and you don't get any new storage. It's a similar misconception of effectiveness that people had about wetlands, where they presumed a wetland led to a great deal of storm water storage. Well, if the wetland is already filled and you have a storm come along, the wetland cannot provide necessarily the magnitude of storage that people were aspiring to. So I do appreciate the user insights from the audience that we do need to remain skeptic about management, which leads me to the first part of your question, which is it seems overly ambitious. Absolutely. and I want to emphasize that what we present here are aspirations. We want to challenge the communities to go for the gold and to disconnect as much as they can and to naturalize the hydrology of that urban environment. It's only by setting ambitious targets are we able to get ourselves toward a greener reality. In actuality, the users that are going to use green infrastructure simulation and iTree do not need to bring in that magnitude of aspiration. They can do something more moderate and choose to take a smaller volume of runoff. 
the current way that we simulate this is through a variable or a parameter called depression storage. What Tom has in the works is a widget that will be a green infrastructure barrel, rain barrel, or cistern that will allow the user to put in more specifications about total volume and location. Now when you have a rain barrel, why is it that your total suspended solids would go down? Well, the reason that our model is simulating that reduction is because we have disconnected the roof runoff into the barrel. The barrel then, if it does surcharge or has an outflow, goes into a pervious area and into groundwater, which means that we've reduced the surface runoff and we're no longer scouring away any of the exposed soils into our surface waters. So I think I covered the three points and I'm, I'm ready for the next question and I'm happy to follow up in more details of any of these. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, what percentage infiltration are you assuming with the perimeter pavement and how are you relating that to rainfall intensity and overall volume? Basically, what volume are you sizing for? That's a critical design question that would allow the user to set parameter values different than what we set. So the way that the model works is it allows a user to select a soil type and then that soil type has a default set of parameters that run the hydrology of infiltration. And one of those parameters is the hydraulic conductivity. And so at this point what we did is we used the existing soils. We didn't presume any amendment, which may or may not be the case for different permeable pavement designs. Some installations will put crushed stone on top of existing pavement, excuse me, on top of existing soil. So the Save the Rain program in Syracuse right next to the On Center has a large parking lot where that was the way they approached it because the soils that we have here are very well drained in some areas of the city. And so we use the existing soil hydraulic conductivity. Other users may choose to change that parameter, hydraulic conductivity or any other component of the soils to represent their conditions. Now, how do we choose whether or not some of the rain will experience a runoff phenomenon and be denied infiltration? The model uses what's referred to as a variable source area methodology where the rain rate is modeled at an hourly time step. The hydraulic conductivity is used to set the infiltration rate. And the way the scenario typically works is at the beginning of a simulation period, the infiltration capacity takes all of the rain. But as the soils wet up, their suction forces drop and you'll find that for high rain rates, we will see a refusal of infiltration and you'll have more surface runoff. This is referred to, as I said, the variable source area concept where we allow for infiltration excess and saturation excess overland flow. The rain rate can be too high to infiltrate or the water table can rise to the surface and refuse infiltration. I think that answers the questions and again, it's getting into some details that I could go on for half an hour and I could learn from the questioner probably for another half hour but if you want, we can go on to the next question and we can follow up with this offline. Okay. Um, we are, we do have quite a few questions that have come in, so we're probably, well, we're definitely not going to get to them all. So we'll be, if yours is not asked, we'll definitely uh, get those answers for you and send them out to the full group. So there were, there were a few questions that came in about the single tree model. Um, do you also have uh, evapotranspiration rates for that, and can you share the DBH and canopy size in the example that you shared? Tom's going to field this question because I want to give him the, the honor of that innovation. Yeah, we have uh, evapotranspiration rates off of that canopy. Um, the single tree run was modeled for a young tree with a uh, LAI of, of around three and then for a tree uh, 15, 20, 25 years after planting with a you know, more mature canopy, denser canopy that had an LAI around five or five and a half. And so we have both interception of, of snow and precipitation rain like you saw, but we also have evapotranspiration rates from the tree evaporation off of the leaf storage, uh, evaporation off of the one meter uh, square pervious area 
underneath the tree canopy and infiltration into that one meter square area to, for a certain soil type. So we don't have the diameter of breast height for the tree. That's not a parameter that we use in Hydra right now. It is used in other eye tree tools, but we use LAI. And it's something that we hope to integrate that canopy structure and, and stem structure into the Hydra model. What I really want to point out about the single tree effect simulation that we are singing about here is that when we were trying to get values for Save the Rain, the literature values are often generated by just one or two studies nationally that say a tree should have this number of gallons that it intercepts of storm water. And we were saying, well, geez, why don't we just run iTree Hydro with a single tree for the weather that we're observing in our area and see what those canopy interception values are because they vary with storm intensity and see what the evaporation values are from the canopy and see what the transpiration values are. And we found that it's very insightful and it can agree with some of those other model estimates if we have the same weather inputs, but it can also show you a deviation from year to year or from tree type to tree type. So I think we've covered that question if you want to move on to another. And again, we can pick up on any of these online after we get off this webinar. I think it's probably in the interest of time uh, best to move on to the last section because we have an overwhelming number of questions that we'll have to answer. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to hand the keyboard over to Tom. There's just a few slides about ongoing model development. Both Tom and Emily are developing iTree Hydro, and they're using an approach that is coupling their engineering and science with community outreach and user inclusion. And so Tom's going to talk about that. Uh, so first of all, I just want to say that you know we're constantly working on a, a model that is several months, if, if not a year, you know, ahead of the uh, Windows version that we released to the public. So we're always tinkering with um, new processes that we're adding, um, things that we're refining, and so on. Um, as, as part of that research process, I'm trying to take the uh, current semi-distributed model and specifically add uh, a cover type for green infrastructure. Um, so you don't necessarily have to go in and tweak uh, the currently allowed cover types, you could specify what percentage of your watershed is uh, set in green infrastructure, what it's replacing, impervious area or pervious area, and then break down that percentage of green infrastructure by infrastructure type, you know, to have specific hydraulic conductivity rates, uh, specific other soil parameters for your GI area. So just showing the current land cover types, we've got uh, pervious, both um, not under a tree and under a tree canopy, uh, impervious under a tree canopy and not under the tree canopy, and we want to add in green infrastructure specifically. We're also working on a distributed version of the model um, that will be able to use uh, the NLCD data um, to actually route water across the landscape. Um, now, in this 30-meter uh, uh, by 30-meter plots that um, give you cover that the NLCD provides will allow you to change uh, the cover type within that area from, say, something with a certain impervious, pervious mixture to something with a higher uh, pervious percentage representing a green infrastructure. Uh, we'll allow the user to pick you know, one of three different uh, common routing algorithms, you know, D-infinity, uh, D8, uh, MSD, so they can model the flow how they wish across their watershed. Um, and this we feel like will represent uh, both runoff flow, runoff volume, and pollution volumes a, a little more accurately. Tom, can I add something? Yes. One of the features that we've been working to release is to allow the user to put within their watershed or urban area their green infrastructure intervention and then watch how the road network or the land surface directs runoff to that intervention rather than asking the user to estimate what is the percentage of runoff captured by their green infrastructure. So here they would put the object green infrastructure intervention in and the model would make an estimate of how much of the runoff is captured. If they don't like that volume, they want to have more captured, they can work with the model to find an opti optimal location to intercept that surface runoff. And this is to help the user move away from having to guess what is the percent captured to using the available land cover elevation data and cover data to get an estimate. Thanks, Tom. Sure. Thank you, Seth. 
And so the, the way that we want to extend the model in these two directions um, is through the, uh, this common model development uh, protocol that was uh, recently laid out and is becoming increasingly popular, mostly in the ecological modeling environment, uh, but we want to bring it over into the hydrological modeling realm. Um, it's TRACE development, it stands for transparent, <coughs> excuse me, transparent and comprehensive ecological modeling. You may have to change that E into something else. Uh, but it's basically nine model steps. Um, and with each of those nine modeling development steps, there's a, a documentation process. And the whole idea behind the TRACE uh, protocol is to allow a common doc documentation to increase users' knowledge of the models, to increase their familiarity with the models, and to also make sure that modelers are, are reaching the end goal of you know, usable data by planners, by decision makers, by community members. Um, so in hopes of following this um, you know, model development protocol, Emily and I want to reach out to users of iTree Hydro, <clears throat> users of other iTree modules, and you know, ask for feedback on the current models that you're using, and also for uh, features that you would like to see, um, options uh, that you would like to be able to model, you know, common problems with input data sets, outputs that you know, you're not finding, and so on. So that's the end. And we do finish with an appeal that you stay connected and keep us involved with your aspirations so we can make sure this tool is functional for the users. Our dreams are that the tool actually has a wide user community and it's been designed to meet the needs of that community. And so we would love to take any more questions and we do want to extend our gratitude to you and again point out our gratitude to our support from the USDA Forest Service Northeastern Research Station, Dr. Dave Nowak and the Davy Tree Company led by Scott Mako. And here at ESF, we've had many people assist us. And I want to point out Dr. Chuck Kroll has been integral into that as well. And he's here within the Environmental Resources Engineering Department. Thank you, Tom and Emily, for your time. And thank you, Vermont, for facilitating this webinar. Hey, thanks. That's great. Um, thanks for helping out. So we do have, uh, well, we have a bunch, bunch of questions still to ask. So we'll rifle through a couple of them and then again, I'll make a note of the question log and I'll send that to you and then as many as you can get to, we'll email those out, it'd be great. Okay, here's a question. Is there a maximum size watershed that the model can handle? No, we don't run global simulations or national simulations at this point in the public domain version of the model. But the model is a distributed tool that would allow you to do a water balance either in a spatially distributed realm or in a lumped semi-distributed realm. So they're, they're, the model is based on the hydrological physics of a green amped surface infiltration routine, which has not shown itself to be scale dependent. Some runoff routines such as the NRCS curve number routine is dependent on storm type. It doesn't perform very well unless the storm is a 12 or 24 hour duration at minimum. And in urban areas, we're often interested in, let's say, a one hour storm. And we can run the model even at one minute time steps in our research mode. So its spatial and temporal extent are flexible that's as far as I'll go with it for now. We encourage the users to consider applications of the model for any urban area or for any watershed area where they think they have representative weather data. Okay, uh, this is a question on soils. What assumptions about urban soils are reasonable given that soils are highly altered by construction, compaction, and reduced by hydrophobic um, substances? So, what we are working with is referred to as an effective soil parameter. And right now we're using a single soil class to represent that effective parameter. And we here in Syracuse have the same phenomena. Even in the USDA soil service classification of urban fill, it could be a clay or it could be a concrete, which is highly porous. And 
in order to represent that uncertainty, you may choose to start doing calibration runs with observed data to come up with a parameter that you believe represents the transformation soil makes with your rainfall to runoff. But if the user is going to reduce the scale of the application to an area where they have a specific soil type and it's not heterogeneous, you can dial in any type you want. It has, as a model tool, the same limitations of any other model tool that's using a single effective value. When you move to the distributed version that we're hoping to release in the next year, you'll see that you can choose as many values as you want. And that comes with caution because you might then have a calibration challenge to make sure that you can optimize those. If you open up a soil survey map, which Emily has done for us on a couple occasions in Syracuse, even the values that you see, as I've mentioned, they can be variable themselves in terms of their hydrologic parameters, and there can be inaccuracies in that mapping. So it's, it's a point that we really appreciate the questioner bringing up. Tom has something that he wants to add, I believe. For the uh, Burlington urban area run, you know, we brought over the uh, soil parameter set uh, from Allen Brooks. We calibrated to the discharge data uh, for Allen Brook and then felt that this was such a geographically close area, uh, the best initial guess for soil parameters would be to bring over those calibrated parameters from Allen Brook. Um, we would do a similar thing in, in Syracuse. There are uh, urban watersheds that we have gauges on. We would calibrate uh, the soil parameters for that uh, gauge data, and then we might run the Syracuse municipal area using that calibrated soil parameter set. Um, but urban soils are an area where I think a lot of research needs to be done, and, and there's not a lot of good data on typical values for urban soils. What we're trying to show in the, in the model, and we again, as Tom said, are about a year ahead of what we're releasing, is how the urban tree starts to change the soil physical pro properties of that urban soil. But we can continue on this if you would like, or we can take the next question. I have another one. Are there any plans to go beyond simple EMC calculations for water quality runoff and go to something like build-up wash-off? Hi, this is Emily. Um, yes, there are. We are currently looking at um, models such as SWOT, the soil water assessment tool, and other nutrient models that are more process-driven. And the problem with these models is that they require extensive input that might not be readily available to a common user. Um, so we are trying to sort of make it, um, create a model that's available for a broad user base that they would be able to get the inputs easily. Um, so just sort of bridging that gap is a direction I'm trying to go in with my research. I will add to that that we actually have coded into iTree Hydro the build-up wash-off functions. We just never released them because we didn't think that the user community was going to want to use the tool at that detail. Uh, some of the urban hydrology community has argued for looking at total load from a storm into a receiving water and not being burdened with trying to simulate the pollutograph at an hourly time step or at the storm time step. And at the same time, if you want to look at the nuances of your green infrastructure and how you would change the buildup and how street sweeping perhaps would change the wash-off concentrations, it might be time for us to bring these back. And so for any of the users that are a fan of that scenario and they'd like to see that within the next release, let us know. And it wouldn't be very difficult to put that into our user interface given the talent at the Davy Company. We can take the next question if you want to go to it. Yep. Uh, could you describe the topo index? Yes. The topographic index is an idea that originates from work in the late 70s out of England. And there was a model called the top model. And it is a way of looking at the likelihood that any one parcel within a watershed is wet. and it is an actual formula. So topographic index equals a ratio of the area that drains to the point that you're standing at divided by the slope of your land surface where you're standing. And a high value indicates a very likely wetness. 
So if your numerator is drainage area and it's big and your slope is your denominator and it's small, your quotient will be a big value. And that would describe, for example, the outlet of a watershed within a stream bed where you have the entire watershed draining into a flat riverbed. If you have a small value, it suggests that it's relatively dry. And so this is a simplification that captures a governing principle in many watersheds where you have a humid, shallow depth to bedrock environment. And it allows for us to rapidly distribute water from cell to cell after we do a vertical water balance. It's, again, a topic that we could go on for a long discussion because it's brilliant and it's got its other features that you can combine it with, such as soils and vegetation types. It also is something that we're not dependent on when we go to the spatially distributed model that we're hoping to release in the next year. We can move to the next question if you're ready. Uh, yes. Uh, are there plans to add other LID practices to the model? Did you, just, did you say uh, low impact development practices? Uh, I should say green, green stormwater infrastructure practices. Yes. There are. And in fact, I show nine simple ideas, and there are so many others that people are interested in. And so this is, again, where we come back to the transparent, comprehensive ecosystem modeling or eco-hydrological modeling, where we want to have that community tell us what are the widgets we should be developing to help them. We can move on if you wish. If the users want to quickly type in some practices they're interested in, let us know. Uh, so I'm trying to filter through through them. Um, we meant you mentioned uh, maximum um, watershed. Is there a minimum watershed, and can you run it without having a, a a gauge flow gauge? You absolutely can run it without a flow gauge, and that's something that we wanted to emphasize. So we appreciate that being brought back up. That is an option, and many users of hydrology models often don't have that observed, and they don't want to limit themselves to a watershed. So you can run this for any sized area where you have representative weather and land cover. So our final example is a single tree, which had a perhaps 5 by 5 meter side by side. You could go smaller if you wish, if you want to just look at a single soil core. It's a robust water balance. Now, how does that actually mesh with the idea that we use the topographic index? So in order to make these types of runs, there are some adjustments we make and assumptions we make within the model that we can share with the user community when we release this. One of the ideas that we have is for users of iTree Design, which is a Google Maps-based tool, to be able to pull the hydro functions and look at the water balance within their own home parcel. If users, attendees to this webinar haven't seen iTree Design, I encourage you to go on. You don't have to download a tool. It's available on the web. And you can imagine giving that tool a run and seeing a water balance for a year's worth or a storm's worth of weather. I just want to add that right now we're using historical weather. We've mentioned we can do climate scenarios, and we're doing those here. But we're also, thanks to Dave Nowak's encouragement, going to be adding design rainfall. So you can choose a, a five-year storm event over a 24-hour rain period, or you can choose your 50-year storm event or 500-year storm event and look to see how your green infrastructure holds up. I know an earlier question was, what did we design our infiltration rates for, for what type of design storm? And that's something that will be coming along as well. If you wish, we can go to another question. I know that we may have exceeded the time of the webinar at this point. OK. I will ask one last question. And this relates to how do you communicate the uncertainty associated with I2 Hydro output? How would you recommend communicating? So that's a topic where I'm going to point to inspiration from something called a, uh, a Ken Reckow model, which is a export coefficient modeling framework that some of the users and, and listeners might be familiar with. Ken Reckow worked with the EPA to try to help them understand the uncertainty of phosphorus and other nutrient loads into lakes. And the way that we currently are doing it within the model is for any of our event mean concentrations, we know that mean value, but we also know the distribution around that based on the EPA's National Urban 
runoff program. And you can then allow the user to see what is the mean value and what are the extremes or the quantiles, the 10%, 25%, 75%, 90%. For the runoff itself, we have, thanks to Chuck Kroll's work as a stochastic hydrologist, within our current research model, ways of presenting that uncertainty. And this is exactly where we need more user input to tell us how to get that into the user interface. If you present it the wrong way, it can often immobilize a user where they don't understand if the model is giving them an accurate prediction because it's telling them about uncertainty. If you present it the right way, it can greatly enhance policy making. We're happy to take more questions. We do not need to go ourselves, but I do understand the webinar is scheduled to close at 4, and so as sad as we are to say goodbye to all of our, our attendees, we're, we're also understanding that we can follow up online later. Yeah, I think let's, we'll cut the questions here. Uh, I have the list of questions on my computer, so I'll send those to you. Many as you can answer would be great. Um, so folks who are on the line and on the webinar, um, there are a lot of questions, so just recognize that it probably will take some time to get those answers, but I will certainly post them and send them out to you as, as soon as we get that. Um, and I'll also send out the link to the video, and uh, Ted, if you could share with me the slides for the presentation, I can put those up on the web too. Absolutely, so great. Justin. Well, yep. So Ted, Tom, Emily, thank you so much for all the work that you're doing on this and for helping us out with the webinar today. Really appreciate it. Um, we you, had Justin. great attendance. Ah, thanks. Uh, I think we had 240 at the at the peak, which is phenomenal. It just shows that there is a lot of interest in the mysterious iTree Hydro, and it's pretty cool. So people are interested. I think it's going to get used, and I think you'll get a lot of feedback, so that's nice. Um, and thanks, Danny, too, for fielding questions and asking them So online. just to reiterate, we, we hope the community can reach out and download this new version in early August. It's our target. Okay, great. What kind of an uh, announcement will come out with that? How will folks know? We hope to see something that's on the itreetools.org website. And there, you can already go online and you can register as a user. And then there will be communication with the existing users to let them know. And the tool will allow for any existing projects to be brought over and converted. And we can guide people as, as best we can on that process. OK, great. So we, we cool. thank you again, and we look forward to following up Great. Well, thanks so much, and uh, have a good night, everybody. Good evening.